This is Bikini Bear, Venerable P.T. Sucker. <laughs> She's the first Briton and probably the whole of Europe's first Bikini Bear. Because I was feeling a bit lonely, I only have one Bikini, which is me. Uh, <laughs> so during the Vains retreat, after about a month, I ordained her. Oh my goodness, Mel's recording. Oh well, <laughs> I was ordained as a Buddhist Bikini Bear. But it didn't shave off its hair. Well, it's a she, but um, you that's know, no it's excuse. It's strange if you had less hair <laughs> on your head than anywhere else, even though that's what monastics have, less on their head than anywhere else. Okay. But uh, my mum very kindly knitted a beanie for her because England's always quite cold. And then we match. So there we go. If any of you want to ordain as bikinis, you do have to shave your head. <laughs> <laughs> so, just two little things before we start the next session, which is our meditation session with Ajahn Brahm. So, um, straight after the meditation, there will be a Q&A session for about 45 minutes, but, but we would ask you to please not write the questions in during the sitting but to wait until after the meditation. And we'll give you a couple of minutes or so to send your questions to Q&A Derek and to have a little toilet break as well. So just so that you can settle your mind without thinking about what you next want to ask. And all the questions will be sent to me at the same time. So there'll be no kind of preference. It will be just sort of going through themes that look um, that look good and interesting and maybe grouping some together if we have a lot of questions. So please only one question each, as I mentioned earlier. All right, so handing back over to Ajahn Brahm for a nice, long guided meditation. Excellent. So with our meditation, we first of all, we close our eyes. So we can actually feel our body and maybe even feel the mind inside. And I know many people talk about the right posture to meditate. But I've had some of the greatest meditation with my legs all over the place, my arms here and one arm there. I always feel that the most important part of your posture is your mouth. To put a smile on the mouth when you start meditating. Meditation is not going to the dentist. Meditation is something which personally I look forward to. I enjoy it. And just smiling at the very beginning does change a little bit of your perception. So the mind likes to engage in this wonderful process we call calming the mind, bringing it to peace and stillness and by strengthening our awareness and seeing more deeply into this thing we call our mind. But to begin with, as before, to check out your body, starting with your legs, as before, asking them, are they comfortable? I'll go through this a bit quicker, this second guided meditation. Just you. Sweep your attention up from your toes, through your feet, to your heels and ankles. And I'm going fast, but if I find anything, as I'm just checking my posture where it needs some adjustment, then I will stop and adjust. And if there's anything inside, in this case, my legs, which needs a bit of softening to allow healing to happen, I will pause there too, and to stay with that feeling and learn how to give it kindness and relax any inflammation, which is around, say, the knees or thighs because of a bruise or something. I learn about my body and I learn how to care for it. So it can last a long time with very, very little sickness. So I'm sweeping up past my knees. So I have my attention to go 
at my thighs. Everything is fine there. To my butt. And again, I don't know why this is, but I need to adjust my bottom position. To make it more and more comfortable. I'm on one of these office chairs, so if you hear any noise, it's the wheels just moving this way and that way as my body moves. And then once my butt is comfortable, it feels, feels really good right now. Then I check my back and move it around a bit, stretch it and find the optimum position for it. It feels good. And then to the front of my torso, all of those places, and it's very important organs, the engine room, as I often call it, of my body. And as I sweep through, just my attention just going upwards through my body, if there's any place which needs some kindness, some attention, I will always pause there to make sure that I don't neglect any part of my body. I don't take it for granted. And I know just recognizing, just like somebody recognizes you and it makes you feel good. Someone is kind to you and respects you. That's what I do to parts of my body. I respect them, kind to them. See if there's anything which they need. I'll just move upwards in my torso feels really good and get to the shoulders just the muscles there nevertheless i make sure they're totally relaxed i know how to do that there's a bit of tension there so i feel that tension in the muscles of my shoulders and sometimes even imagining them relaxing just imagining that any tightness which was there is now released. I don't know what pulls on the ends of those muscles, but sometimes I imagine a little demons living in my body, pulling them apart. And I imagine them just letting go. Wonderful word, let go. So those muscles feel loose and free. That's how they feel right now. Let go of the tension. With the letting go of the tension, the feeling of stress vanishes. I'm not pulling or pushing. That's what stress is. We push ourselves or pull ourselves. In meditation is a time for peace, not for achievement. I go down my arms. past the elbows, or down the forearms, just checking everything, and relaxing as I go. I'm always amazed as how much you can relax of your body, just by feeling it, and just imagining the letting go, or loosening, or ease. And the feeling of my forearms, it just, they feel different, they feel comfortable and at ease, they tingle. The very pleasurable feeling of ease. And I go to my hands, making sure the hands are well positioned, especially the fingers. And I don't leave that part of my body until I'm confident that the hands are in a good position. And I don't decide what that position is, I just ask the hands how they want to be. I feel the best position for them. Then I go back up to my sh shoulders and neck, making sure the neck is really nice and free. And there's not too much tension. If my head is not balanced on top of the neck, it just causes some stress on the neck muscles. 
So I often just move my head backwards and forwards at this stage until I find the best position. Then I go to the front of my face, around the eyes, around the, the mouth, and the nose and forehead, any place I can feel any tension. I learn how to relax there. It's like you can lift up your arm or put it down again. After a while, you just learn how to relax muscles. Around my eyes, I can feel the tension there. I'm now loosening it. Bringing it to a deeper and deeper state of ease. I'm relaxing my mouth. I can't feel any tension on my face at all. And that shows me that my emotions are also relaxed. And then I go to my whole body, just imagining it not as parts, but as one organism. Everything nicely balanced, supporting one another. And I stay with my body, just finding if there's any tension anywhere and easing it off until I, I notice the sense of ease and the delight of a relaxed body. Sometimes it's hard to find similes. Just like when you wake up in the morning, you don't need to go to the toilet, you're just laying down there. And you feel so comfortable, so cozy under your blankets or sheets. Now your whole body is at ease, relaxed. You don't want to go anywhere. Just the delight of relaxation. And the reason I think that is important is that when I've focused on that delight of relaxation, and that becomes one of the main objects of my mindfulness. I notice the relaxation gets even deeper. The deeper the relaxation, the more health, the more comfort. And it's like the joy of it just is a bonus. But it's not just a bonus. It keeps reminding me to perceive the joy in meditation at all stages of meditation. To notice the joy in it really takes the meditation deep, quite rapidly. The reason is the joy stops you wanting to think and wander off anywhere. The only reason why people have a wandering mind is because they're not happy where they are. And the mind is really happy in this moment. It doesn't want to go anywhere. It's satisfied. And then I let my body go and go into the mind, the peaceometer. Just notice how peaceful I am. Surprising, it's not as peaceful as it was when I did the earlier meditation, probably because I've been doing committee meetings. <laughs> and I know how to make it peaceful. They go all past. Realize my future is being made now. I focus right here. I don't force the mind. It's like I allow the mind to go on the beautiful mattress of the present moment, soft and comfortable, warm and safe. Safe being here. I don't need to think or give names to things. 
develop this understanding, this knowing, which doesn't need names and descriptions. There's no peace in this moment. When the mind becomes silent in this moment, let's also know how joyful this feels. Don't think of going to some next stage of meditation. The old saying goes, when you want something more, you can't enjoy or delight in what you already have which means the meditation doesn't go very far. Just enjoy this moment, however it is. Whatever you're experiencing right now, right in front of you, so it is the most important meditation object in the world. What you're experiencing now. It's all you have. The only way to respond to this is with care, with loving kindness, softness, patience. What usually happens to me at this stage, and probably for many of you, you start to become aware of your breathing. And I used to decide to watch my breath when I was a young meditator, but then you don't need to. The breath is one of the last things moving comes up naturally. When I watch the natural breath, rather than go looking for it, it always feels more peaceful and delightful. Just like I learned to notice the pressure of a relaxed body. I start to notice the joy. Entirely it's called Piti Sukha. Of a natural breath, unforced, is coming into my body and leaving it again. Sometimes, similarly, I use this like sitting by the, the ocean, just on a quiet, windless day, just a very, very soft ripples, tiny waves come up the beach, and then they recede again. I can't control the speed or the volume of that water coming up and going away again. No more can I control the amount of air coming into my body or receding. I just calmly, softly observe. Making sure I see the delight, this beautiful freedom without having business to do. And not needing to think, not being under pressure to change or improve. This moment just is. You'll be at peace with it. Just watching the breath come in and go out with joy and delight. And you start looking for the 
delight you find it. Certain flavour, taste of freedom. I'm going to be quiet now, about 10 minutes, allowing you to also experience what happens to your mind when you let it be and enjoy the freedom of peace.
about five minutes to the end of the meditation. How peaceful are you? Are you happy to be here? Appreciate the joy. How peaceful is it inside? How content are you in this moment? Content and easily satisfied. Not demanding anything, appreciating your mind like a, a garden with no plantings in it. Just sit down, enjoy special delight of peace. You know, you know, need to think. You know where this peace, this joy comes from. Just 
when you search for meaning, you chase it away. You lie still and let things be. All the meaning in the world is right in front of you. Now, how does your body feel right now? Start to become aware of your legs and your bottom, your back and your torso. All those organs inside. You're really peaceful. Others important parts of you have a chance to relax. Shoulders and arms and hands across your head, within your brain, so overworked. Now hopefully it feels at ease. You didn't need to struggle or strive for things could just be calm and knowing joy. Now, if you'd like to open your eyes to end the meditation. For those of you who wish to go to the toilet, please do so now. In about a minute's time, you can start the questions. Hopefully that wasn't too long for people. Sometimes uh, I sit long periods to really get into it. Don't want to come out. Mm. Oh, I'm going to let my brain boot up again. Like when you first turn the computer on, it needs to, to load up all this um, skills like talking and being able to be aware of something different rather than inside, be aware of the world outside. Mm. Okay, I see. Derek is just looking at his computer, so he must get some questions coming up. There's some time so that when you get a nice quiet meditation, you just, questions don't have any meaning. Don't need questions. However, as the brain starts working, <laughs> the questions will come. There's questions coming. It's okay. So whenever anybody wants to offer the first question, I'm very happy to attempt to answer it. Okay, so fire away. All right. Do you believe that we're all born with Buddha nature and by following the Noble Eightfold Path can be Bodhisattvas without ordination? It's you no know, for the idea of a Bodhisattva is you know, it's a path to help others, but the greatest way you can help others is being fully enlightened. I mean, if you went to, if you were sick and you wanted to go and see a doctor, which doctor would you want to see? One that's uh, fully um, certified, got all the um, past the degrees and 
have done all of the training, would you want someone who's done all the training to heal your body or someone who's still practicing the training? The Bodhisattva is just one who's still practicing, haven't reached the goal yet, the end, not fully enlightened. So that's why I would always prefer to hear teachings from fully enlightened beings rather than those on the path. But the idea of everyone's got Buddha nature, of course, means that each one of you, there's a beautiful thing inside of you. One of those similes which I've given often is the simile of the thousand petal lotus. That's you. And the job of meditation is to actually open up that lotus. The lotus opens up because of kindness and awareness. Symbolized by the warmth and the light of the sun. So you open up and one thing I've seen, which is a beautiful thing, it's not what I read in the suttas, or they can see it in there. See, the beauty of the human being is a very beautiful realm. People do stupid things, but way beyond the stupidity of human beings is their purity, their goodness, their kindness, their love. If you go deeper inside of a human being, you get to jhanas and things disappearing and gorgeous stuff. So yeah, that's Buddha nature to me. And every human being has it. They may not realize it. They may not open up their lotus deep enough to see that. But it's there. It's one of the reasons why you respect everybody, no matter what race, religion, gender or whatever. Okay, please ask another question because I can take a question like that and talk for the next 50 minutes on it. Okay, Ajahn. I would like to just clarify that question a little further because when yeah. you say Buddha nature, what do you mean? Because I know that you don't believe it's something inside. Yeah. So because some people consider it as like some kind of cosmic consciousness. So could you just oh, say a yeah. bit more about what you mean by Buddha nature? It's the nature to get enlightened. What was a Buddha anyway? Sometimes, I'm, I don't know, I usually do this on wayside days to get people to do a meditation, imagining, the, imagining they are the Buddha sitting under a Bodhi tree. And they really get into it. I get off on it because it's like a taste of enlightenment. You feel, what, what would it be like if you had no more desires, no more wants, you don't need anything, no problems, no anger, no sort of one improve anything or get rid of things. Imagine what that would feel like. And after a while, just you know, for about 20, 25 minutes of doing this, you get an idea of what it means to be a Buddha. <coughs> Free of all wanting, just being here. You now really deeply in this moment, I need to think, because thinking is just like the, the like the bills of a government, the ideas to try and get somewhere. You don't want to get anywhere in the whole world. You're just happy where you are. You don't need thoughts. You can't really survive there. And then you just get so peaceful and start disappearing. That's a Buddha nature. Something you feel rather than you describe with an intellect. So what I really mean is everybody has the ability to be absolutely totally in mind and to disappear and vanish. Okay, the next question. I am at the moment having difficulties with life. With all the stress, work and private, I feel I'm heading to burnout. I've been doing a lot of meta meditation, but I feel I'm not making a lot of progress. Are there more or better practices that would help? Thank you. Yeah. It's only one way of meditation, basically. And it's just letting go, putting things down, allowing things to stop. Okay, I, I mentioned this in a series of talks I gave to the group I teach in Hong Kong. And it was this um, cartoon 
in this card here, about four or five little um, images. But the most amazing thing about it is how um, articulate and deep the cartoon was. And they found a copy of it and they put it on the screen when I was teaching in Hong Kong. But anyway, it starts off with this, this man who's very upset, just burning out, angry, upset, tired. He had a sign saying, I want happiness. He goes to see a monk. Oh, let's change it. He goes to see a nun. <laughs> and <laughs> and the, the nun so takes the sign. First mistake. The first word, I. He scrubs that out. And what's left is want happiness. Second mistake, want. He scrubs that out. And he holds up the sign with those two words deleted. What does that say? Happiness. And the monk and the lay person, so the nun and the lay person are just so happy. The problem with I want happiness is just those first two words. I want. You let those two go, and anything which is left is happiness. So if your meditation is not working, it's because it's your meditation. You're doing it. It's another thing you have to do, like degrees, like getting certificates to do this and to do that. This is not about attainments. This is one of those brilliant sayings of Ajahn Chah, who would repeat this again and again and again and again. He said, we meditate to let go, not to attain things. And he kept on saying that. So what is he talking about? But after a while, when you try and attain things, you have no peace. There's always something more to attain. When you let go of this, this thing which wants to do the attaining, when you let go of any place on the wall where you can put your certificates, then you can't achieve anything. There's no one there to do the achieving. It's peace. You've got nothing else to do. Be peaceful and happy. So the I want happiness. It's the I and the one causes the trouble. Great. There are lots of questions now, Ajahn. So uh, we'll, do, <laughs> okay. we'll do our best. Uh, so is right effort more about what you should be doing with your time rather than making effort per se? I heard it called right endeavor, which seems more appropriate. Thanks. Yeah, the, I well, I, I try to find something like that right endeavour. These days, I'm leaning more towards right renunciation. So endeavour is still trying to go somewhere. Uh, effort is trying to do something or get rid of things. It's like it's more like the letting go, and that is you know, based uh, in the teachings of the Buddha on the the ways of sense restraint, which. Uh, you know, in the gradual training, which is a parallel to the Eightfold Path, that seems to take the place of you know, things like you know, Samo Ayama, right effort. And it's about like letting go of stuff. And sense restraint is not something you do. If you're doing it and forcing it, it's just too heavy. Sense restraint is you're not interested anymore. You know, I meditate because I prefer just the five senses turning off and you know, being very loud and very alive. And there's no sound as beautiful as silence. There's no vision, no view more beautiful than when there's nothing in the, in the, in the sight of sense. And all of the beautiful feelings in your body, there's nothing as beautiful as delightful as when the body turns off. You just have your mind peaceful, still, blissed out. It's one of the reasons why, little by little, as you meditate, you realize the path is one of letting go. And that is why it is so easy. If it's doing things, sometimes you get tired. If it's striving, sometimes you go down the wrong path. But how can you do anything wrong when you just let go of stuff? <laughs> it's 
such a nice path, so easy, so joyful. And we somehow or other human beings think that we have to work so hard to get happiness and safety. And then we end up just making a mess of our world. And we don't get safety at all. We get COVID and other stuff. But how nice it is, how wonderful it is, just to let things be. I'm talking about, you know, not as a political or social strategy, but a spiritual path. Sit in your room, wherever you are, and just, you don't want to change a thing. You bliss out and you teach that to others. Ooh, it's powerful. Anyway, sorry. Um, please interrupt me because I can keep going on. I understand that suffering must be understood. As someone with trauma and bad experiences, I know I've pushed away and not faced difficult feelings. I've become emotionally numb and some, sometimes dissociative. If these yeah. feelings are hidden from me, how do I give them attention and deal with them? How do I know I've let go? I'm concerned that I'm spiritually bypassing and that sometimes I may be feeling calm and joyful, but it's just my mind deceiving me. Oh, now you know the difference between the joy, which is not afraid of anything. And this is, I, I can't uh, refuse to take the opportunity to talk about how one group anyway, over here in Australia, took some of those teachings, well-known teachings of mine, the opening the door of your heart, that uses an incredibly powerful therapy for survivors of torture and trauma. You know, really heavy cases where people have been abused and raped and beaten and just how they survived. They told me some of their stories and it's, it's, it's gross what they went through. And they come to a place like Australia and they're physically free, but emotionally they're still in the prisons and the dungeons and the torture chambers of the past under some terrible regimes. But anyway, they do this open the door to your heart practice. When they feel safe, it cannot be forced. It's when they feel ready for it. And then they imagine, they close their eyes and a bit of meditation. And then they imagine this heart in their chest, Valentine's Day heart. Imagine two doors, big doors, and the doors open up. And inside the heart is that part of you which you are at peace with, at ease with. All those you know, things you're proud of, things which bring you joy and happiness, maybe some family members, your house, your cat, or whatever it is, your teddy bear. Things which you like, and those part of you which you approve of, they're inside. <laughs> But then outside, you see, because you open the doors of your heart, you see these little girls who were beaten and raped and abused and mistreated. You see them out there. They're outside of your heart. It's a metaphor, but it's a beautiful one. They're on the, the cold concrete outside, freezing, wet, hungry, Ajahn's uh, screen has stopped. Let's see if he disappears or comes back. Is that the same for everyone that the screen stopped? We can't hear Ajahn anymore. So maybe his connection has gone. Yeah, he's disappeared. That means he's probably dropped off and he'll hopefully come back soon. So let's wait for a couple of minutes. Let's see what happens. Otherwise, one of the co-hosts can answer the question. Ha! I'll see if he sends me an email. Actually, if his uh, computer stopped, he probably can't send emails either. So then I'll have to answer the questions myself. 
we can take it in turns with Derek and Rennie and Mel and Leone. <laughs> yes, so uh, no emails. Okay, maybe I'll just quickly answer some which are quite easy to answer. So the first is from, yeah, from someone. Uh, dear Ajahn, sometimes when I meditate, it's like lights that are bright and white. And as a reflex, I want to open my eyes to see if something's shining on me. Do you think wearing an eye mask might help with this reflex? Any other ideas? So yes, I think that wearing a mask can definitely be a good idea and make your room as dark as you can so there can be no doubt as to whether it's the sun shining in or light escaping through the tiniest little crack in the curtains. That's what I do in my uh, meditation room. I have like these long thick curtains and I just make sure I cover up all the cracks. And these hats are also really good. So you can just pull them straight down over your face. So that's another nice way. But I think over time you'll get used to this. And you know, part of it is also fear and possibly excitement because it's something different. And of course the mind is not used to seeing this kind of thing. So you interpret it as a light. Actually, it's not a visual light. It's just the mind's way of interpreting um, something that's probably turning more towards a mental phenomena, probably the breath, if that's what you're used to practicing with. And so over time, it will start to uh, become more natural to you and you'll be able to keep kind of calm. Because at this sort of stage of meditation, if you move at all, everything kind of collapses and the lights maybe disappear or the calm in your mind, the joy that you've built up, the stillness starts to disappear. So one other way that I would suggest is that if this is something that happens quite regularly, you could actually program your mindfulness in the beginning of the session. So this is one of Ajahn Brahm's uh, methods and it's also found in the suttas that you just tell yourself right in the beginning of that session, if the light arises, my mind will be still. I will not move the mind. My mind will stay still. Or whatever it is that you want to uh, program into your mind. And you just say that very calmly and clearly in the beginning of your sit. And then forget all about it and just carry on the practice as you normally would. So this might be of some help. And Ajahn's still not back, so... Sorry about that, everyone. What can we do? You have me instead. <laughs> so, sometimes I feel afraid of dying without having attained stream entry. How to overcome this fear? So I think with any emotion, whether whatever it's about, and this is a valid kind of fear to have, I can really understand that myself as well. Um, with any emotion, it's not really about overcoming them. It's more about learning to meet them and understand them. So I would say, first of all, if there's this fear that's quite persistent, trying to get familiar with that fear, like just getting in contact with it. How does it feel in the body? How does it feel in the mind? And through that, you can actually practice the path so that when the fear arises, you meet that fear with a sense of curiosity, a sense of investigation, wanting to understand it, and also with kindness, with gentleness, and with a sense of making peace. And then you're actually practicing the path. And this is, in the end, anyway, the only way that you're going to take steps towards stream entry is by walking the airfall path. So it doesn't matter, really, how far you go in this life whether it happens in this life tomorrow or in 10,000 lives, if you're practicing the path, because if you're practicing it in its fullness, every step along the way, you're developing beautiful qualities that benefit yourself as well as benefiting others. So in a sense, sometimes I think, well, if it takes longer and yet I'm able to serve more beings, you know, help others in a, in a deeper way on the path, what does time really have to do with it? And I think the more you practice the path and the confidence arises in the process, you know, that we don't control this process, but if we continue taking steps on the path, it has to lead to liberation. Then that confidence will help you overcome that fear. Yeah. So just keep practicing step by step and understanding that no step ever goes waste. So next Sometimes when I try to meditate, I feel no joy, no peace, just stress, tension, dissatisfaction, and lots of sticky thoughts. 
If I try to stop thinking, more thoughts come. Do you have any advice for situations like this? So I think this is a great situation because you're saying that you have lots of sticky thoughts and if you try to stop the thinking, more thoughts come. So this is your wisdom arising, which is the first wise way to make use of the thoughts to actually understand what fuels them and what causes them to dissipate. So obviously you're finding that if you fight with them, you know, it actually makes the situation worse. So from that, you can infer that if you actually make peace with them and make peace with the stress, with the tension, even with the dissatisfaction, then what happens to those emotions and moods? If you're at peace with dissatisfaction, you can't really be dissatisfied anymore, right? So we overcome these things, if you want to use that word, not by trying to change them, but by changing our attitude towards them. And it's in that attitude, that response, that wise way of relating that the path starts to unfold. You know, that's the incredible teaching of the Buddha that, you know, we don't have to go out and fix up everything in our lives. It's impossible to do that. If we did, then none of us would ever have a chance to be at peace. But we can have some influence around the way we relate to our lives. And this is where our freedom lies. Of course, that doesn't preclude taking action and sometimes taking strong action against things like oppression and any other kind of situation, you know, that's maybe social injustice or racism or all those kind of things. But we do so from a place of compassion, you know, from understanding motivated by um, the right intentions of peace, kindness, and, and um, non-harm. So it's the same with our mind. We want peace, we want joy, we just get stress and tension, but if we fight that, we make it worse. So if we can make peace with those things and actually learn to welcome them, then we can start to understand the way our minds work and the way that suffering is overcome. So I hope that helps. And don't feel that there's something wrong with you. And that, you know, you're supposed to be feeling certain things that you're not. Meditation is all about just having a look at what's actually arising, having a look at how this body and mind is working, not how we'd like it to work, but how it actually operates and how we create a lot of suffering for ourselves by our responses. Oh, still no Adrian. I'll just check my email <laughs> to see if he's come back. Maybe he won. Maybe the Davis took him off to an early night, because he must be very tired. But no, he's disappeared. <laughs> okay. Recently, I found it really difficult to meditate. And when I do, I don't enjoy it. Even today, I felt like just running away after a few minutes into meditation. I had very sad, upsetting, hurtful feelings arising. I let them in and even cried a little. So no feelings of peace for me. And I struggle to offer kindness to my thoughts and myself. I don't meditate every day anymore as I feel like this is the kindest thing I can do, but I'm not sure if that's the best way to get back into enjoying meditation again. Please advise. Yeah, this meditation path is a tricky one, isn't it? Because on the one hand, we want to enjoy our meditation. And on the other hand, the meditation is actually a window into seeing how things truly are. So it's almost as though we have to start enjoying seeing things as they truly are, <laughs> rather than having a particular kind of content of the experience. And I think, I mean, it's great that you turned up today and you managed to sit through that urge of running away. And it sounds to me like you did manage to make peace to a certain extent because you did let these things in and then cried a little. And I think that is already if you want to call it progress or a softening of the heart, because sometimes, you know, what we really feel when we're, I mean, you say sad and upset and hurt, and sometimes that manifests as anger or irritation or, you know, just feeling like really hard done by. But underneath that is a deep sadness. There's actually something much more tender and, and, and vulnerable there. And it seems like you were able to tap into that vulnerability a little bit. And from that place, I think it's possible when you feel strong enough to offer yourself a bit of compassion. So sometimes it can be as simple as putting your hand on your heart and just saying, you know, I'm here for you. Like I'm here for myself, you know. <laughs> um, it's okay to feel how you feel. Just offer yourself some kind of phrase that allows you to um, embrace those feelings 
and shows yourself that you care. So this is self-compassion, right? Mindfulness is like saying, okay, I'm feeling hurt, I'm feeling sad. Compassion is saying, uh, I care for this sadness, you know, or asking yourself, how can I care for this hurt? So go very gently, I would say, because the last thing you want to do is have part of this inner tyrant, this inner negativity, pushing you around and saying, you know, come on, meditate. Oh, you're no good. You're not meditating. For goodness sake, you know, it, it's no good to buy into that. But at the same time, it might be helpful to gently encourage yourself from time to time by recognizing, you know, that whenever you do sit, there is a slight softening, there is a slight release. And these things are impermanent. You know, you can start to observe how these things are not always there. You know, you say that you're often feeling this way, but there'll be different intensities, different shades, different textures and moods that come and go. So when you start to see that also, it gives things space. Instead of you sort of going, gosh, it's that again, and like contracting around it, you manage to widen the sort of screen of your mind and just give these things space to arise and pass. And that starts to become quite interesting when we can develop enough kindness and equanimity to observe those kind of afflictive emotions. It can be quite interesting. And that tends to, again, give you encouragement to keep going. How do you know when to just let go or when to act? That's a huge question. And I guess the simple answer is we really have to know for ourselves. If you're talking about, for example, um, letting go of an external situation, maybe a relationship that isn't working or... Hi, Rennie. Is that John back? Okay. Yes. Oh, hello. <laughs> Great, you get, you get the question I just started to answer. What was the question? The you question so well. was, well, I could finish it. It was how to know when to just let go or when to act. It's mostly, we know how to act, so we should do more letting go. <laughs> In other words, we tend to just uh, act too much. So just uh, err on the side of letting go more. That was easy. <laughs> yeah. Sorry okay. about that. My internet connection just totally stopped. I had to reset it. We thought you'd gone to Parinibbana, Rajan. <laughs> oh, well, so lucky if that would happen. <laughs> One day. <laughs> Can I, I just for that thing which I was saying, I'm not sure if you, mm. did you finish that question which I was interrupted in? The one about the oh. uh, opening of your heart? Carry on, Rajan. If there's something oh, okay, you yeah. I know there was just that invite all those little use up into your heart. And it's a difficult thing to do. Instead of trying to get rid of them, you embrace them. Well, that little person which you're you know, ashamed of or feel guilty about or which hurts so much, you come in. You give them a hug. You embrace that part of you which was traumatized. I see those people have done that, and uh, I just, I'm so impressed by them because they've been through things much, 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 much worse than I've ever been through, and it's beautiful what they did. So anyway, yeah. And I look, I've been all channel, I've got some good energy, so if you want to go on, because I'm a bit sort of disappointed that the internet came down, if you mm -hmm. want to carry on until an extra 15 minutes, go to 10.15, I'm very happy to do that. Thank you, Roger. Knowing your generosity, I am not surprised that you said that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind. Okay. So there's already been one about thoughts and there's another one. So maybe that will help fill out the last one too. I find quietening my mind difficult as thoughts have a magnetic pull. Wow. That's it. It's nice to see. It's an old story, the gaps between thoughts and the superiority of silence. Yeah, thoughts do have some pull, but silence has an even stronger pull. And there are times when you can go out for a walk and uh, in places where there's hardly any people, or at times when there's very few people, and you open your ears and the whole world is silent. There's, there's many times I've done things like that, going into caves I love, because there's no, nothing moving there. Or even that time, many, many, many years ago, 
I think I should be able to tell you now, 40 years ago, that uh, when Chithurst Monastery was starting and I just went, went visiting there because I was visiting, I had no duties and went for a walk one morning. It was sometime in December or January, it's minus 36 degrees outside. And of course I had lots of clothes on and scarves and hats. But what was beautiful, there was no one out at that time, no cars, no um, aircraft, no animals, no birds, just like me in this forest. And when I stopped walking, it was silent. The whole world stopped. And I just loved that. I just didn't want to walk because I didn't want to disturb the, the gorgeous silence. And of course I did walk, otherwise I'd have frozen to, frozen to death. But it was a silence, a stillness. That was more attractive. So once you start to notice silence in your own mind, it's amazing just how powerful that is. And each of you in your own room, there's lots of emptiness in your room. You may think there's so much stuff there, but if you have a look, there's more air, more space in your room than there are things. We don't notice the, th the space, we notice the things. The same with our thoughts. We notice thoughts, we don't notice the spaces between the thoughts and the spaces which surround those thoughts, which give birth to those thoughts and where those thoughts seize us. All that silence, that's, that's, that's some gorgeous stuff. So after a while, don't try and force those thoughts out of your mind. Just see the alternative. Silence. And when your eyes open, you're not meditating when you're walking. There are times in your house, in your garden, it's totally quiet. And that is blissful. Okay. I believe I'm at the point in my practice where it's not uncommon for people to consider monastic life. How do I tell whether the wish to become a monk is genuine and worth pursuing or just a temporary fleeting phenomenon? I just say any way to know the, whether it's fleeting or whether it's just a passing thought is to give it a try. Don't shave off your hair and give it a go. Because I would ask this, I'd the similar question, answered a similar question, I think today. And it's so hard for me, and I've you know, been in this business a long time to know if someone's going to make it or not. You know, there's some people that want to become monks or nuns and you know, you give them a chance and they just, they leave almost immediately. And there's others thought, these are no hopers. There's no way they're going to make it as a monastic. And they just blossom and thrive and they're gorgeous monks and nuns. And so I can't tell. So give people a chance. Have a go at being a monastic and see how free it is. It's gorgeous life. And for those of you who like serving and giving, the serving and giving part of monastic life, you could, where was this? So that was on the weekend retreat, which I was teaching over Zoom for the uh, Hong Kongies. I mentioned you know, what motivates me it's just every now and again, someone comes up to you and they say, if it wasn't for you, I'd be dead. And they mean it. And you can tell in their eyes or the tone of their voice, they're not making this up. There's something you taught, some advice you gave, or just a little bit of kindness, a smile. If it wasn't for that, they would have committed suicide. And they mean it. Imagine what that feels like as a monk as a nun, someone tells that to you, and it's real. And it means that it's not just my, my own happiness that I become a monk, it's actually just for the benefit, the happiness and well-being of all others. And that, honestly, that, no exaggeration, I'm being truthful to you, done it hundreds of times. People have come and said that to me, <laughs> wrote emails, wrote letters, wasn't for you, I would be dead. Thank you so much for saving my life. I mean it. Well, that's, ooh, that's like getting a million dollar lottery, lottery winning number. And it's not sort of money, something much more valuable than that. Meaning, value. 
So anyway, let's give it a try. It's too good an opportunity to miss. Okay. So this is someone's experience in meditation just now. So after 20 minutes, my neighbor's kid next door had a ten temper tantrum. It was pretty intense. I got startled again and again. It was unpleasant and difficult because part of my mind was always on the alert for the noise. There was no more mm. peace after that, just heart palpitations. If that was next door and it's not your kid, just leave it alone. You know, you can't leave things alone. That's one of those, if you can't do anything, then do nothing. And you know, I just test myself out quite regularly that just, I think one of the last times I had about an hour or something before the car would come, I was in Bangkok airport to take me to this conference. And they said, do you want to go to some restroom or something? And I said, no, I just want to sit here. And it was in the middle of the concourse with people making their mobile phones and talking and chatting and announcements being made. And I just, I didn't, I didn't bother the sound. And it's just, and it's beautiful piece for meditation in the middle of the concourse. And it's not that hard to do. As Ajahn Chah would teach me, it's not the sound disturbs you. It's you who disturbs the sound. And you can figure the meaning of that one out. And if, what happens then is the kid's probably got a mother in there somewhere. And you know, she's dealing with it as best she possibly can. And you can't really help. You only add to the noise. So you let the noise disappear. Always in this moment. And then, yeah, ah! but then that doesn't last many seconds. And then there's some silence afterwards before the next, ah, it doesn't disturb you. For many people, sounds like that, they echo inside your mind. The sound is finished, but you're still thinking about it. That's the problem. Okay. Uh, I've been attending your Friday night talks online and oh. enjoyed them very much but one story about the gentleman who fell into deep jhana and was taken for dead to hospital etc oh. <laughs> has caused me to develop a little fear about letting go too much in meditation is this oh. something to be concerned about absolutely not concerned about that at all it's a wonderful thing <laughs> and it's quite a few years ago now that particular incident but if you ask the guy that would you rather not have done that of course not it's the biggest bliss in his life he never had so wonderful meditation. And the amount of insight and understanding he got afterwards was huge. What really sort of fascinates me is why would people be afraid of something like that? It's one, well, number one, it's totally safe, which is the amazing part of it, that you, know, you can't get harmed at all in such states. There's, there's one contemporary um, story, which so you probably heard me say about this monk over in, in Indonesia. And uh, he was meditating in the jungles this was quite a few years ago. And he was um, got into the jhana experience and he was submerged under a flash flood for days. And uh, not breathing, but having a wonderful time. And he came out afterwards and it's an amazing monk. You know, he passed away uh, some years ago, so I talk about him now. We try and keep these things sort of secret for a while because we don't want people being uh, grabbed by university science departments and investigated on because they're weird. So it's no, never, don't, please don't be afraid of anything like that. It's a totally wonderful experience. And I don't know if you have cancers and stuff and diseases, but you get into these deep meditation, those diseases haven't got a chance. You know, this is, they're too powerful for the body and this, things get healed. Come out afterwards and there's, where's that one gone? So there's totally positive experiences. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if people want to be identified, but you know this person, I mentioned them right in the beginning, Ajahn, if you remember. Okay. No, I don't. <laughs> Uh, all right then. How is it that I'm experiencing more joy and lightness, even as responsibilities are piling up in heaps? 
is this another function of Myra telling me I don't need to be a monastic to experience the fruits uh, of the path? <laughs> no, if you become a monastic, you experience some like double, triple, wonderful. But it's one, it's great. You're experiencing joy and happiness. I mean, you're doing lots and lots of work, but that also means that you are um, you're giving so much. Remember, just part of what I said earlier about you know, right effort, right renunciation, or you're letting go of what I want and my comforts for, for others. You know, it's a well-known bit of psychology. You know, if you have a sort of an apple and you eat it yourself or you give it to somebody else, where do you get the most happiness from? It's always giving it to somebody else and seeing them just really enjoy, you know, that thing, which, you know, you should have had yourself, but just that giving, letting go what I need, what I want for others. And whoever that person was, they're doing some of that and it's just, joy and happiness. Many people are depressed in this world because they don't know how to give and serve and help others. One of the easiest ways to overcome things like depression is serving, giving, not thinking what I want, not thinking what I can give to others. Huge boost of energy and purity and goodness in this world. You see people like that and oh, they <laughs> They can't get depressed ever again. But when we have a self-centered society, when it's all about me more than others, then of course depression grows. It was just the other day. I was, oh, where was it? I think yeah, it was on the questions after the Friday night talk. Somebody said, it's not a question, it's just a comment that you know, I was depressed and I heard you say such teachings. I said, and it went almost immediately. Now, no drugs involved. Just this beautiful change of attitude. And the person got it. And he said at the end, thank you for saving my life. <laughs> Powerful stuff. Okay, next question. Okay. Um, I find as I let go of more... Uh, let of more things, it feels like I'm disappearing. How do you manage this fear? Oh, disappearing is great. <laughs> disappearing means you're not a target for suffering. Suffering can't find you. If you want to really overcome that fear, there's one of the books with my name on it. It was talks which I gave, which I think Ajahn Bramali just you know, noticed are really good talks and transcribed them, edited them, reprinted them. And this is one of my monk friends. He's over, he was the head monk in um, Indonesia. Now he, he told me when I met him not so long ago, he said, so that's the best Buddhist book on meditation I've ever read. And I take his advice and his comments so seriously. And it's about letting go and disappearing and blissing out and getting so close to enlightenment. Why not? You can do it. And as you disappear more and more and more, you come back into the body and mind again up afterwards in this life. But the more you disappear, the more free you feel. And it's a beautiful feeling. So go for it. Okay. How do we know how long to meditate? I assume there's no finish line to be attained in meditation. So how do we know if we've done it long enough? It's, if you're enjoying it, <coughs> carry on. So that's, look, no, no, I had to teach the 45 minute meditation just uh, this eve, oh, to me this evening for you, yes, this afternoon. And oh, quite, Honestly, I just, I don't like that because I was having a nice meditation, nice and peaceful. Oh, do I have to come out? But how I come out earlier than I want to, or earlier than I feel happy to, is that you tell yourself at the beginning of your meditation, I will come out after 45 minutes. I will come out after 45 minutes. I'll come out after 45 minutes or whatever time you decide to. And it always works. It's a brilliant method. And if you don't you know, need to come out, 
and you're having a wonderful time, then carry on. And sometimes in the Buddha, when he's sitting under the Bodhi tree, he never had a bell to tell him when to come out of meditation. As long as you're enjoying it, carry on. How long do you need to sleep? If you have to get up to go to work, fair enough, you've got to set an alarm. But if you don't have to go to work, you lay down and sleep as much as your body needs. And personally, that sometimes I don't need much sleep at all, sometimes a lot. But I let my body decide. It's not how long I should be meditating. It's how long my mind feels like it needs meditating. So often I ask my mind, say, mind, how long do you want to meditate? It's your, it's your call. It's not me. And I let my mind make that decision. And sometimes it meditates for many hours and has a wonderful time. Sometimes it can't because it needs to do some sort of duty. Just two more then, Ajahn. Yeah, go for it. How is it that when I do a meditation guided by you, I always go to some very deep states of bliss and quieten the mind much more deeply than when I do any other meditation? Is it trust or just your turbo energy? <laughs> turbo energy? You can see <laughs> that the energy is not sort of turbo. You can't drive a fast car with this type of energy. But it's very focused and very stilling, very peaceful. And of course, that does have an effect on other people. That's why I teach. And I saw that with Ajahn Chah, that sometimes they're just sitting with him. Or just listen to a talk. And it's, you know, sometimes you knew all of that, all those information, all those stories you've heard many times. But sometimes, you know, when he's in a really powerful mood, then you can that you could just sink into those stories. You could feel them and be them and just be released from them. And they're the amazingly power you get for when you meditate. And you share that with others. So it's wonderful. It's very delighted. You have lots of bliss when you're in the guided meditations. So I don't think it's what I say so much as that I'm meditating deeply with you. And you can resonate with what I'm experiencing and thereby experiencing that yourself. It's the only explanation which I have. But it's great when those things happen. So well done. Okay, there's still two more. <laughs> yes, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. All right, so one's quick. Can we be reborn into different species? Of course you can be reborn into different species. Can we be, be reborn into heavenly being species, into ghost species? Not just animal species, but yeah, human beings can be reborn into animal species these days. I just, I know it's a quick question, but one of my um, less intelligent uh, lay disciples here in Perth, and he was a very good meditator and kept his precepts, was kind and generous, a really good person. When I asked him, you know, when you die, what do you want to be reborn as? He said, I want to be <coughs> reborn as a dog. So you want to be, excuse me, <coughs> you want to be reborn as a dog? Why? He said, look, <coughs> he's the Malajan Brahm. Dogs don't go to work. Dogs get well fed. Dogs have free health care. And they spend all day sleeping and lying down. They just take their owner for a walk, maybe once or twice a day. All of you, have, have you ever seen a dog stressed out? Very, very rare. How many of you get stressed out? So imagine you get reborn as a dog. You don't need to go to work. You, know, you don't have to worry about anything. You've got a nice home and you've got a nice uh, food and water and you can sleep most of the day. So you had a good argument there. But of course, the answer to his predicament was, I said, well, don't you know that in many countries, I'm sure it's the same in UK, certainly in Australia, that if you're born as a dog after the first few weeks, you have to get taken to the vet to get desexed. And you can see his eyes go wide and start to tremble. He said, oh, okay, I don't want to get reborn as a dog. <laughs> so anyway, yes, you can, but it's not really advisable. But if you want to, fine. But it can be done. 
Okay. So when meditating on impermanence, I sometimes feel that my life is without a footing, i.e. like an anchor. Is it normal to feel like that? It is common to feel like that. But if you're meditating on impermanence, again, go to the joy of impermanence, the freedom. Look, it's like when I, gen when I was very sick in hospital, many, you know, my first year as a monk, it's grub typhus. And, and Ajahn Chah came up to me and I was just so, so uplifted. This great teacher would come and see me in hospital. And he came and what he said afterwards, I didn't like it at all. He said, Brahma Wang, so you either get better, you either get better or you'll die. And then he left. <laughs> His bedside manner was terrible. You'll either get better or you'll die. But the thing is, you can't argue with that. That was anicca for you. It means that when you're very, have a lot of suffering, it cannot last. And that's very reassuring. But when you're having a lot of happiness and joy, that won't last either. So we have to let both of them go. And that's very powerful. And so after a while, it doesn't cause any trouble. It causes a sense of freedom. You can't control anything. So you, only, you can only let go, that's the only thing you've got left to do. And you can't control, you can't make it happen this way or that way. Just enjoy this moment and let it be. Okay, next one. That's it Ajahn, it's bedtime for you. Okay, okay, I'm trying my best. I'm very so sorry that the internet cut out, I'm not sure why, but you know, that's life. Even the internet is on each other, you can't control it. So I'll try <laughs> my very best. And so I wish you all happiness and well-being. And please look after Anukampa Bikuni project. It's very important. It's close to my uh, heart, if you like. Just I give it a huge amount because I always feel that, you know, you got a wonderful Bikuni there in England. And I just totally support her and to try and get a place so more of you more of those faces I see here can one day have their hair shaved <laughs> and and have the opportunity to become a bhikkhuni gorgeous life being a monastic and but it's so difficult to do you know, only because of you haven't got the facilities so that is just one of the, the things I saw such a long time ago and I'm still working my butt off and I continue to do that and so we've got not just a place for bhikkhunis, but many of them there as well. I'm going to see some bhikkhunis all over the place in England. <laughs> Hundreds of them. Hundreds? <laughs> Why not? Go for it. Hundreds of bhikkhunis. Imagine what that would be like. You know, not just in, in Europe and Canada and where else are you over there? There's Portugal or something. Imagine Italy. It be all this. Italy, all this. These incredible nuns all over the place. <laughs> Wouldn't that be just a, like a dream come true? I reckon so anyway. I'm really into it. I'm doing the best I possibly can to make that happen. So anyway. Thank uh, you, course, Ajahn. I'm not, we're not looking for volunteers right now. <laughs> you know, they've got a place, but, you know, just wonderful in our minds. So. And I say that because I just get so much out of being a monk, monastic life. You can see yourself. I have a tiny bit good, tiny bit of good meditation. And I'm just buzzing with energy. <laughs> I should be really tired. I was up at, oh, I'll tell you, 2.30 this morning. <laughs> this is Perth time. <laughs> I've been busy all day. There's so much good energy there. That's so at 2.30, that's about 20, yeah, 20 hours ago. Anyway. I'm not tired at all. Yay. So thanks for meditation for that. So anyway, I better stop talking and let you go to whatever you need to do. So I wish I'll, I'll give you a little blessing. I feel like it's okay. Yes. Okay. Sabaroga winimuto sabasanta pawajito. 
Sapa vera mati gando ni puto chato wang bawa sapiti o iwa chantu sapa ogo wina satu mate bawan wan tarayo suki di gayu go pawa apiwa dan hasilit seni chang wu ta pa chalino chetaro dhamma wa tanti ayuano sukhang palang Happiness and well-being. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Ajahn. And yes, on behalf of everybody, just enormous gratitude to you, Ajahn, for all your support and service and practice, which is benefiting so many people. So thank thank you very much. And thank you, honestly, sincerely for giving me the opportunity. See ya. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. So Ajahn will disappear again intentionally this time. And uh, as for us, it is now 15 minutes into the walking period. So.